Hi there, I'm Lisa. The service will begin shortly. We're now online, but we are more than a video. We are a church community, and we're here for you to help you know God, grow together, discover purpose, and make a difference. Here's some ways that you can take those next steps this week. Hey, we have a special event coming up for you parents called Moms Rising on November 8th. Join us as Lynette Lewis hosts a conversation with speaker, author, and parenting guru, Arlene Pelicane, as she equips you on how to rise and thrive as parents in such challenging times like this. Topics that we'll touch on will be screen time, how much is too much, and how to creatively leverage technology, and much more. Look forward to seeing you then. Families, we're here for your kids as well. We have two Zoom meetups every Sunday. For kids age seven to 12, we meet at 2 p.m. for the Kids Club Digital class. If you're a teenager or in high school, or you know a teenager, please reach out. We have a special youth service every Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Please reach out and get connected. We know that this is a really hard time for a lot of us right now. And as a church, we're here to support you. And there's nothing wrong with reaching out for that support. If that's you, text ENNYC HELP to 97000 and someone will be in touch with you. We believe in the power of prayer, the power of consistent prayer and community prayer. Every day we take time to pray together and we want you to be a part of it too. We pray Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. On Saturday and Sunday, we pray at 8 a.m. If you're not into early morning, don't worry, you can still join us at our Tuesday evening prayer at 7 p.m. To get prayer call information, text prayer call to 97000. Hey guys, if you wanna be a part of our ENNYC bumper videos, like this one and do what I'm doing, you can email Zach at ENNYC.org. So come and get involved. If you need any additional info from what you just heard, go to the quick links at ENNYC.info. And things are changing constantly, so we wanna keep you in the loop. So be sure to follow us on social media at Every Nation NYC on Facebook and Instagram. The service will begin shortly. Thanks so much for joining. At Every Nation NYC, we participate in what God is doing through our church and in our city by giving generously. Practically, it could not be easier to give through your phone using a secure giving platform called PushPay. To begin, you'll text ENNYC to 77977. When you get a text back, you can click the link that's in that text to complete your one-time registration. From there, you can confirm the amount that you'd like to give and other required giving details and tap next. There you can confirm your payment method. You can give either by bank transfer or by card. Enter your details and tap give. Here's my top tip. When you choose to give by bank transfer, there's no fee and 100% of your gift will be going straight to the church. Once you do that, you'll receive a confirmation text and email confirming your donation. It takes just a few minutes to set this up for the first time and just seconds to give every time after that. PushPay also makes it super easy to set up a recurring gift and to check your giving statements. Thank you for your generosity. You are making a difference. Your giving helps make this online service and reaches thousands of people every week with the good news of Jesus Christ.
At Every Nation NYC, we participate in what God is doing through our church and in our city by giving generously. Practically, it could not be easier to give through your phone using a secure giving platform called PushPay. To begin, you'll text ENNYC to 77977. When you get a text back, you can click the link that's in that text to complete your one-time registration. From there, you can confirm the amount that you'd like to give and other required giving details and tap next. There you can confirm your payment method. You can give either by bank transfer or by card. Enter your details and tap give. Here's my top tip. When you choose to give by bank transfer, there's no fee and 100% of your gift will be going straight to the church. Once you do that, you'll receive a confirmation text and email confirming your donation. It takes just a few minutes to set this up for the first time and just seconds to give every time after that. PushPay also makes it super easy to set up a recurring gift and to check your giving statements. Thank you for your generosity. You are making a difference. Your giving helps make this online service and reaches thousands of people every week with the good news of Jesus Christ. Hi there, I'm Lisa. The service will begin shortly. We're now online, but we are more than a video. We are a church community, and we're here for you to help you know God, grow together, discover purpose, and make a difference. Here's some ways that you can take those next steps this week. Hey, we have a special event coming up for you parents called Moms Rising on November 8th. Join us as Lynette Lewis hosts a conversation with speaker, author, and parenting guru, Arlene Pelicane, as she equips you on how to rise and thrive as parents in such challenging times like this. Topics that we'll touch on will be screen time, how much is too much, and how to creatively leverage technology, and much more. Look forward to seeing you then. Families, we're here for your kids as well. We have two Zoom meetups every Sunday. For kids age seven to 12, we meet at 2 p.m. for the Kids Club Digital class. If you're a teenager or in high school, or you know a teenager, please reach out. We have a special youth service every Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Please reach out and get connected. We know that this is a really hard time for a lot of us right now. And as a church, we're here to support you, and there's nothing wrong with reaching out for that support. If that's you, text ENNYC HELP to 97000 and someone will be in touch with you. We believe in the power of prayer, the power of consistent prayer and community prayer. Every day we take time to pray together and we want you to be a part of it too. We pray Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. On Saturday and Sunday, we pray at 8 a.m. If you're not into early morning, don't worry, you can still join us at our Tuesday evening prayer at 7 p.m. To get prayer call information, text prayer call to 97,000. Hey guys. If you want to be a part of our ENNYC bumper videos like this one and do what I'm doing, you can email Zach at ENNYC.org. So come and get involved. If you need any additional info from what you just heard, go to the quick links at ENNYC.info. And things are changing constantly, so we want to keep you in the loop. So be sure to follow us on social media at Every Nation NYC on Facebook and Instagram. The service will begin shortly. Thanks so much for joining. Hello there. 
Welcome to ENNYC's online service. My name's Randy. This is Celine. Hello. My cute daughter, Sela, and Joe's at school. Hello, Sunny Boy. Woohoo! Thank you for welcoming us in your home. I'm sure if we were really there, you'd serve us chocolate croissants, cheese danishes, and thick cut bacon. Now, I would love for you guys to stay connected and please chat it up on our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube pages. Coming up, we've got the word from Pastor Nathan, and worship is going to be trem. Nope, it's not tremble, but we will tremble afterwards. But first, we're going to trust in you here again, and then we're going to tremble all with the worship team. So I'm excited. Let's get it going. Here we go. Can you worship? God, we come before you today just humbled and honored to just be in your presence, Lord God. I just pray that every person that is hearing this, that is worshiping, this morning, God, that you would touch their hearts, touch their minds, Lord God. Just give us your joy, give us your peace. God, let us just worship you freely this morning. God, I just pray that your presence will be with us, God. We thank you that you go before us and that you are with us. We trust you, God. We put our full trust in you. And we worship you today.
we just speak your name, Jesus. It's a powerful name. It's a wonderful name. Jesus, Jesus. That every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as we worship you today, Lord, that you would be with us. As we move forward throughout the week, Lord God, that we would always cry out to you and declare Jesus. That you are Lord of all, Lord over everything, over our circumstance. And knowing that you're a great God, we can fully trust that you are a God that is in control. And we so thank you, God, for who you are, for all that you've done, and for all that you have yet to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That was powerful worship. So glad we have a moment where we could take our focus off our problems and the problems of our country and the world and focus on God and how sovereign He is. Another way of expressing worship is through giving. You could go to ennyc.info and click the giving link or text ENNYC to 77977. So, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. How many times have you heard that in Christian circles? Well, I remember a time when I was first tithing as a college student and I was writing a checkout. I remember there was sadness in my heart and I was saying, God loves a cheerful giver! Boy, was that painful. But what does that really mean? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about their promised financial support for the ministry of the gospel. Um, he wanted to make sure that they weren't giving because they felt like their arms were twisted but that they had the right heart behind it. Let's see what verse 7 says. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So it looks like there's a correlation with our attitude of giving with what we've decided in our hearts, with what we actually believe in our hearts. Thank God, Paul doesn't just stop there in saying we gotta give cheerfully but he actually lists down and encourages the Corinthian church why we should have a cheerful heart. That's found in verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. The question is, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that even right now, as we are, as we are facing our racial reckoning, a fierce pandemic, political hostility, and economic instability, that God is able to bless us by making all grace abound and giving us everything we need to overcome these challenges that we face day in and day out, that He can provide for us our daily bread, and then some, that He can give us the sufficiency to be a bridge and mend and restore broken relationships in our family, our workplace, and even in our society. Do we believe that? So I encourage us all, to stop looking at our ability to give, because that will really cause us to have sadness in heart. But that let us start looking at God's ability and sovereignty that He can take care of us, take care of others, and take care of the world around us. Maybe, just maybe, if we get to understand and believe that, we can start giving with a cheerful heart. As Bishop Tony Evans said, giving should be a joy, not a job. Let us pray. God, thank you so much that you are so in control. That means that you're even in control of my finances. But give, thank you so much for giving us a part of our responsibility to show our trust and faith in you by asking us to give 10% of our giving. Give us the courage to actually believe in what you said. I mean, after all, Jesus, you did die and rose again and proved that you are powerful and you are in control of all the areas of our life, especially our finances. We bless your name in Jesus' name. Amen. In these tumultuous times that we're living in today, we can be thankful and grateful that there is a constant love of God and blessing of God on our church family, bringing forth the next generation of leaders. Very thankful to announce today that Favor is going to be a part of our servant leadership team. If you know her, you love her. If you don't know her, you're gonna know her because this woman is anointed of God. She will be leading our prayer ministry and she'll be helping the servant leadership team to become better and stronger together as we are a unique, diverse team 
and a wonderful church family, but a tremendous leadership team. Let's go to this video clip and you'll see what's happening. And tonight we're gonna see a, a different level of grace come upon um, favor as we bring favor into being, uh, being our prayer director. This is a woman who, I can tell you one thing, we're introducing her as the prayer director here at Every Nation New York City. She's already been a prayer leader here. But the, the thing I love about Favor is that she's already known in heaven and hell as a prayer leader. So, you know, so it's just, but there is a place uh, of, of a position when that God recognizes positions and loves to come, mostly because God loves to come and work alongside us and to, and, and to come and show off through us. And so as we bring favor into this position, it's not because we think that, you know, she's going to get um, that, that it's, it's, uh, it's not something that we we're kind of create a human hierarchy with, but we know that in the heavenlies and in the spiritual realm that there's an authority that goes with this. And so we're excited to see her step into that authority and see what God will unleash through. So I want to in, invite you all to join with us. We're going to just lay hands on her pray over her and so would you stand uh, and and since this is a worship encounter night we're just inviting God into this moment because this is a holy moment this is not just something that we're doing just because we need to do it this is a moment we're coming for, before the Lord and we feel like God has put his hand upon her to step into this role and so we believe that this is a holy moment there's going to be a new anointing upon her but also upon this church because I believe that, that as she steps into this role, God's going to take advantage of this moment to move our church in prayer to a whole new level and so would you join with me as we pray for her, favor why don't you just come to the middle here, just come to the middle here Father we stand before you and Lord we know it's, it's really not about humans or human organizations creating positions and places and and honors but god we just recognize that before you there's a place of honor and before you there's a place of authority and that god tonight you are placing a new level of authority uh, within this house upon favor and that father god you've chosen her and you've called her lord god You've anointed her. And Father, we're so excited because we know that when you raise up a person, Lord God, it's not to fill a position, but it's to accomplish a purpose. And so tonight we're excited for all of your purposes that you are excited to unleash through favor as she steps into this role. So Father, we just, we, 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 we consecrate her now. We place your authority upon her. We say, Lord God, have your way through her life. God, I, I pray a, a new level of anointing upon her life, a new level of authority, a new level of intimacy with you, Lord God, a new level of being able to hear your voice and to speak, Lord God, with your authority. I pray you give her a wisdom that transcends human wisdom, insight and vision, Lord God, from a heavenly realm. In Jesus' name. So we did have an incredible night of worship just last Sunday, setting in favor into our SLT. It was a powerful moment. I want to say it personally, favor, welcome to the team. We're so glad that you could be aboard and really helping to advance the cause of, of, of creating disciples through prayer ministry in our church. I believe that the kingdom of heaven is rejoicing and hell is shaking. Favor, you're a force, and we're so glad that you're with us and working with us. So today, we are walking into a brand new series called Enthroned, and it's all about how God is sovereign, how he's sovereign and mighty and powerful and causing the great big details of our universe and the tiniest details of our lives. This is a moment for us to cling tightly to the bigness of God. In this moment, our problems and the chaos of this world can seem to be so much bigger than God. But friends, God is so much bigger than our problems. It's going to come down to where are we going to focus our attention and what are we going to believe about God? 
I've heard a lot of people say in this season, through prayer meetings and, and different venues and avenues and all good meaning, I understand where this sentiment comes from, but I just wanna, just wanna tweak it a little bit and it's this, God did not cause COVID-19. God didn't cause it. And honestly, I see nothing in scripture that would, that would attest to that. I never see a God that's out of control. I never see a God that, that even says, you know what, I'm going to sit passively by and kind of allow this evil to happen. We're praying every day, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and it says this, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven and I'm going to heal their land. But the verse just before that, God takes a lot of responsibility. And he says this in verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send the pestilence on the people. When I command, when I shut up, when I send, God is taking responsibility. He doesn't shy away from his own sovereignty and we shouldn't either. I understand the sentiment of trying to remove God from the evil, to remove him from the pain that we're, that we're experiencing, to go, God, this isn't your fault. But there's a step a little bit further in that says, God, it's not that I'm placing blame, but I'm placing trust. God, I trust that if you brought me this pain, that you're going to see me through it. God, I'm not blaming you for my circumstance, but I'm trusting you in it, that you're sovereign, that you're in control, that this moment is not outside of your control, it's not outside of your will, but that you're doing something through it. We don't want to think of God as causing us random pain with no purpose. But that assumes that this moment has no purpose. That assumes that God isn't working something better through it. Pain is only evil if it serves no purpose. We, in fact, pay for pain all the time. We pay for our massages. We pay for surgery when we need it. We pay to go to the gym. Those things make us better. They make us stronger. They bring healing and betterment to us. Though they cause us pain for a moment, they make us better. And I believe that this, is, this moment is about making us better. It's painful. But will we trust God? Will we enthrone God? And that's very much what we want to do in this, through this series. Place God on the throne of our hearts. He's always on the throne of the universe. Will we place him on the throne of our hearts? I believe that God is doing some mighty things through this moment. This moment is to see God enthroned in our hearts. It's to question what truly are we worshiping? Are we worshiping our comfort? Are we worshiping our government? Are we worshiping the situation around us? Is that what we're in it for? Are we in the God game for our own benefit or our wealth? Or are we in it for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords alone? This moment is about enthroning God on our hearts. It's about seeing idols laid low, idols of government, idols of comfort, idols of, of, of entertainment. It's about God addressing some deep sins in our nation and around the world. Uh, this, this moment has exposed, like never before, systemic racism and injustice. This moment, I believe God ordained it for these, some of these things to come up to the surface so that we can deal with them so that we can repent, so that we can lean into the uncomfortable conversations. And I want to commend you, church, as we've gone through the guide, the, the uh, race, injustice, and discipleship guide, that we are re being rediscipled in this moment to see the world, to respond to pain, to go towards pain with actual loving kindness and a message in this moment. We're going to be better because of it. P pain and sorrow will last for the night. Joy is going to come in the morning. Let's trust God. He's being like a master surgeon right now, cutting some things out of our hearts so that the unity that's in this Every Nation Church is going to go deeper than ever before. We're going to love each other more than ever before. We're going to serve each other better and serve our city better than ever before because of this moment. Also, as the coronavirus has wrapped the globe, I believe that God is setting up in the next decade a revival like we've never seen before that's going to span the globe. As a, there's a common experience now between every man, woman, and child around this entire 8 billion person globe, I believe that God has set the stage for his kingdom to advance on a global, st on a global stage like never before. And every nation church, 
Our name says it. We're going to step in and see God move like never before. God is setting something up. Don't remove him from this situation. In fact, trust him more. See that he is sovereign. See that he's over all. The only question in this moment is how will we respond? Where's our heart? Are we going to obey? Are we going to step in? Now, the the acute among us, the, 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 the sharp among us are going to say, all right, so God is sovereign over all, but Nathan, now you're saying that I have to respond? Now that you're saying that I have a responsibility to? Yes, absolutely. These two truths are simultaneously absolutely true. God is in charge of every detail of our life, and we are absolutely responsible. God is sovereign. You're responsible. God is sovereign. You're responsible. These two truths are held up in Scripture side by side, time and time and time again. It's not that the authors were neurotic. It's that the authors knew God. And it's for us to dial up in our lives both of these truths to 11. It's not that we walk in some tension or uh, holding them in balance. No, we just turn them up and live in attention. Turn them up and live in attention, not balance, tension. God is sovereign. You're responsible. And the book or a passage that I want to zoom in on today is the book of Jonah. In my Bible, it's it's two pages. It's pretty brief. We're going to study the book of Jonah. And Jonah is probably best known for getting eaten by a fish. And I'm going to do my best to actually skip that part of the story today because I believe that the fish distracts from the rest of the story. The story of Jonah is not about a fish. The story of Jonah is about idolatry. It's about racism. It's about the mission of God and the grace and love and mercy of God. The book of Jonah holds up a mirror to our lives and asks, will you respond in love to the things that God loves? It's a powerful story. We all know how it starts um, with Jonah being called. In verse 1, it says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up to me. Their evil has come up to me. The city of Nineveh uh, was the, the seat of the Assyrian Empire, and the Assyrians were known for their brutal and genius military tactics. They would invade cities and conquer peoples, including 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they would absolutely decimate their society, kill their people, destroy their culture. Yes, in, in fact, in, um, in the British Museum, there's pieces that were found uh, in Nineveh, outside of modern-day Mosul, Iraq, uh, that are hanging there, demonstrating some of the incredibly cruel torture techniques that they would use, including skinning people alive and having people grind their own family's bones. These people were insanely evil, cruel by every standard. And God called Jonah to go to them, to call out against their evil. Instead of going, verse 3, but Jonah arose and fled to Tarshish, exactly in the opposite direction, exactly the wrong way that God was calling him to go in. We might think that Jonah was scared, but later Jonah reveals his true colors. Jonah wasn't scared in this moment. He was something very different. God calls. This is something that I want to just point our attention to. God calls. He calls each of us. God is calling you today to take another step in your faith. He's calling you to arise, to go. I don't know exactly where that's to or who that's to, but God is calling you today to make a move. We can't hear the word of God. We can't get in the presence of God. We can't sing our praises to God and not be changed in some way. Today, God is calling you to move. Today, God is calling you to go. Perhaps you've never been baptized before. I believe that today, God is calling you to be baptized. If you're not a member of a church, then I believe that God today is calling you to become a member of our church, to join our movement, to reach New York City, to transform the city one life at a time, to help people know God, grow together, discover their purpose, and make a difference in this city. Today, God is calling you. Perhaps you've never given your life to Jesus. I believe that today, God is calling you to know him, to walk in a relationship with him. 
And if you would like to be a part of this community or be baptized or know Jesus, then I'm going to invite you to send us a text right now at 917-905-2324. Let us know what God is doing in your life. Just say, hey, I think it's time for me to get baptized or I'd like to begin a relationship with Jesus or I'd like to join your church or how can I help in mission or how can I volunteer with you? Guys, pick up your phone, send us a text, let us know. 917-905-2324. So, Let's pick back up with Jonah. He's crossing the Mediterranean Sea, trying to escape from God, and God starts to bend the universe to capture the heart of Jonah. God starts to throw all he can at Jonah to start to turn his heart. He starts with wind and waves, and then it ends in whales, and God is doing everything that he can, including, I believe, manipulating some dice in there to turn the heart of Jonah around. Finally, After three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, Jonah is vomited out on dry land, a a bit of a new man and willing to go to Nineveh. In chapter three, verse one, it says this, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And God gave Jonah again a second call. How good is it that even when we disobey, even when we rebel, Even when we miss the mark, even when we run the opposite direction of the thing God is calling us to, God will give us a second chance. We serve a God, not of a second chance, but also the third and the fourth and the fifth, and God will keep coming after you, keep running after you. Today is the second chance. Today is another chance to serve him. Today is another chance to do the thing that he's been asking you to do. God loves you and operating in grace toward you. Go do the thing that God is calling you to do. So Jonah makes it into Nineveh, finally, and preaches the most lame sermon I can find in Scripture. He says this in chapter 3, verse 4, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overturned. Can you imagine just walking into Nineveh? Yet forty days, Nineveh is going to be overturned. The end. He packs it up and goes home. In in Hebrew, it's five words. Five-word sermon. Nothing about God. No mention of their evil, no call to action. But God breathes on this stupid message that Jonah preaches and starts to turn Nineveh around. Nineveh, Nineveh, in fact, is overturned. It's overturned from evil to good. It's overturned from, from, uh, from injustice to justice. All of Nineveh repents. From the least of these to the greatest of these, everybody repents. They put on sackcloth. They start fasting. The king declares a fast and says even the cattle and the sheep are going to fast. Everybody from the king to the cows repents. God uses in his sovereign, beautiful, in control way, he uses the stupid, (laughs) we gotta love him, the rebellious, the lame preaching, the awful prophet of God to turn the most barbaric people around. God's sovereign. He uses bad things and turns them into good. He uses rotten things and uses them for his glory. God uses the broken, scared, poor preaching, And what we're going to find, seriously judgmental, Jonah, to turn around Nineveh. So Nineveh repents. They repent from doing evil. They turn from their wicked ways. They don't actually turn to God, perhaps because Jonah forgot to mention that. But they do repent of their evil. And in chapter 4, we find more of Jonah's heart. He says this, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste and flee to Tarshish. Now why? We would think that maybe he's scared, right? He doesn't want to go to the people that literally kill or skin people alive. He doesn't want to go to that place. But why, Jonah, do tell. For I knew, Jonah says, that you are a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Jonah says, God, I didn't want to come here because I knew you would save them. I didn't want you to show them love. God, I wanted judgment. I wanted wrath. And I knew that that's not the kind of God that you are. 
God wants to save people. God wants people to be turned from their wickedness. God wants to rescue people. The question is, do we find it in our heart to love others the way that God loves them? We've experienced his love, but then we, in, its pla- in, in place of God's love, give out our judgment. And that's what Jonah did here. Jonah then walks outside of Nineveh and sets up camp, waiting and wishing that God will, in fact, judge and bring fire and, 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 um, and brimstone down upon Nineveh. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under the shade till, uh, till he uh, should see what should become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed, again, God is sovereign, and now he's not just appointed wind and waves and whales and dice to bring Jonah to this moment, but now he appoints a plant. And he made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade over his head and save him from his discomfort. Even in the midst of of Jonah's judgment, God cares about his comfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the plant, not of God, but of the plant. And uh, And when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. The book of Jonah is just as much about a worm eating a plant as it is about a whale eating a prophet. It's not about a whale. (laughs) God appoints a worm that attacks the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. Again, God is appointing all sorts of things, changing Jonah's environment to try to capture his heart. So the sun beat down on his head and Jonah was faint. And he asked, uh, and then Jonah asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live little melodramatic Jonah. And God said, Jonah, do you do well to be angry about the plant? He said, yes, I do. I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came up into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? that great city with more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and so much cattle. And that ends the book of Jonah. God points to his prophet and says, you pitied the plant. You lost your comfort. You lost your, your, your shade. And you mourned for your shade. You mourned for your comfort. But my mourning is for the people that don't know me. I mourn the injustice. I mourn the, the, the lostness of these people who are doing stupid stuff. They don't know the right hand from their left hand. You mourn your plant. You mourn your comfort. You mourn that you have to wear masks. You mourn that you have to stay inside. But I mourn the injustice. I don't care so much about your comfort. I care about my mission and I care about my word going forth and I care about people being saved and I care about evil ending. God cares about things much bigger than us and he uses by his sovereign will discomfort in our lives, taking away things in our lives so that we might join his mission rather than ours. This moment, if we'll let it work on us, if we'll let it wash us, if we'll let it renew us, we'll change us from the inside out. God, time and time again, is trying to rescue his prophet. Not just Nineveh, but also his prophet. It amazes me that the only thing in the book of Jonah that disobeys God's word is the prophet. And the most effective and fruitful thing in the book of Jonah is God's prophet. That is the grace of God. Every nation church today, we stand because of the grace of God. It's not because we've done something good. It's not because we are the best preachers. It's not because we're the best business people or most educated. It's not because we're the most beautiful. It's not because we're the best in our careers. It's not even because we serve God the best or pray the most. It's because God has chosen to grace us. Each one of us, as a collective body, 
every nation church and as individuals in the city and the surrounding area, God has graced us and that is how we stand. God has blessed us and that is how we pray. And if we let that blessing get in the way of his mission, God will take away the blessing sometimes. God will make us sit uncomfortably in the wind and the sun to make us again love the things that he loves. It's time to examine our hearts. He's calling us to love our city. He's calling us to engage our city. He's calling us to love our neighbor. The question is, can we get over ourselves enough? Will we trust him enough to love instead of curse? To go out instead of stay in and comfortable? Right now, there's a big bad election happening. And right, uh, it's, it's Sunday before Tuesday when we're going to cast our final votes and they'll be tallied. And I believe that it might take a little while to fully tally those votes. But through it all, friends, I want to call us to trust God. There's going to be a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety in our nation. A lot of outrage and even outrageification behind so much of the media, behind so many of the postings I see. The desired outcome I see is outrage. Is to get people angry. To get people angry at those nasty liberals or those awful conservatives or those Democrats or those Republicans. They're always doing and they will never say and it's just supposed to provoke. People of God, can we provoke in a different way? Can we provoke to love? Not just outrage? Can we be provocative in a different way to serve God rather than just be tribal? Can we provoke to love our neighbors and engage with our communities? rather than just trying to rip each other apart. In this moment, can we enthrone God rather than just instating a president? This is a moment for us to check our hearts and allow the circumstances around us to peer into our hearts. God has sovereignly appointed these circumstances to change our hearts to worship him, to change our hearts to love him, and as such, love what he loves. Well, I not love that great city, 120,000 people and so much cattle. And I can see here I'm saying that of New York City right now. Would I not love that great metropolitan area with nearly 10 million people in it and so many Broadway shows and so much money flowing through Wall Street and so much art and entertainment and so many incredible educators. Would I not love that beautiful city, New York City? Don't curse this city during this time. Don't run from your mission during this time. We have been brought here to be a blessing to this city. We have been brought here to reach the nations that have been brought to this city. Every nation church, we are here for such a time as this. We were born out of 9-11. We were born out of catastrophe. We were born out of the ashes. And this is a moment for us to thrive. This is a moment for us to give. This is a moment for us to engage. This is the moment for us to worship God by loving our neighbors and caring more about others than ourselves. This is our finest hour. Where we choose in this moment to enthrone God and respond humbly with our hearts. I want to pray for us as we close here today. God, your word is incredibly convicting. I see so much of me in Jonah. I see so much of Jonah in your church. God, thank you for loving Jonah's and thank you for loving Nineveh's. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Lord, would you please use that incredible gospel message to turn us from the inside out? Would you use these circumstances and this moment to change us, God, to love our neighbors, to engage in our communities, to care about those who are far from you, and not just care about our tribal platforms. Help us, grow us, expand us. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a powerful word, Pastor Nathan. Thanks so much for that. So interesting. Growing up, I always thought it was Jonah and the big fish. But I could actually rename it now Jonah and the big God, where God is so sovereign that he's in control of everything. But does that mean I have no part to play? No, I'm responsible to answer to him and line up with his will as well. Well, let's process this further with discussion questions. 
So the first one is, can you give an example of a going to Tarshish moment from your life when God called you to do something and you ignored or tried to, tried to escape his call? Ooh. Number two, when you're facing a challenging or painful moment, what differences does it make to know that God is absolutely in charge? Can you give an example? Oh, and that's me too. Three, God can often use an experience of losing something we love, like Jonah's vine, to teach us a greater truth about God's love. What are some lessons God may be teaching you through the losses of 2020? And four, God expresses great care and concern for the great city of Nineveh. Both the people and the cows, what might it look like for us to love NYC in this season? I'm so glad that you asked that question. And I'm excited to hear what you might have to say further about these questions and maybe even what I might say. So you can join us if you'd like to hear those answers from us on Thursday when Every Nation New York City releases its discussion topic conversation on these questions with Pastor Shino. And also, what part do we play? Well, there's a great way that we can play by blessing the city and joining in prayer. We're going to be praying together and continuing to pray together Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. and also on Saturday and Sunday at 8 a.m. and Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. If you want to join us in praying for the city and a lot of other things, then you can text prayer call to 97000 to get more information about that prayer call. All right, let, let me pray for us. Um, God, it seems like there's so many immovable mountains and problems to fix here. And why do I need, even need to pray? But thank you that you said in your word in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Lord, help us believe your promise. Help us believe that when we do communicate with you in prayer, you line up our hearts with you, we become part of the solution to the problem and you do something behind the scenes and in a tangible ways. We bless your name, Lord. Thank you for blessing us with your heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll see you next week right here again. Can't wait to join you and see what happens then. Bye. Bye. King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation. You are, you're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. You're the peace to the restless. You are. There is no one like our God. There city you're the king of these people you're the lord of this nation you are you're the light in the darkness you're the hope to the hopeless you're the peace to the restless you are there is no
to come, great and 